the thing about this question is that you're given a mass per unit length, a, a mass density of the object, and it's linear, so it doesn't necessarily have to be triangular shaped, but it's, its mass increases in a way that's similar to that. The C would just determine how wide the base of that triangle is, is what it really amounts to. So if you'll recall, we have um, center of mass, which is a distance, and it is the integral of r dm divided by the integral of just dm. Now, in your class, I might have said that it's, it's just the total mass at the bottom. But as we don't know what the total mass is, we will have to do integration to figure out the mass. And then moment of inertia, again, is an integral, and it's r squared dm. Now, you have a sequence of steps that should help you do this problem. And so I'm going to say those things as I work, but as I've been finding out, your notes are woefully inadequate for you many times. So consider that this series of steps is one that should already be in there. Uh, I'm going to start by picking my uh, point of reference. And, and we were kind of given the point of reference. We were told that the mass density, <coughs> excuse me, the mass density starts from the light end. So our point of reference is going to start here at this end of the object. And we're given that the mass density is Cx, which means it's, it's just linear and gets more massive as I go to, you know, away from the starting point. A um, couple things I think you should probably consider before we start. The units of C. Right, this has to be a mass density, which means the, the lambda will have to be kilograms per meter. That's what lambda is. So the units for C since I'm multiplying by something in meters, this has got to be kilograms per meter squared. This has got to be the units of whatever this mass, this value for C is. It's just a constant. And, and that's all you really need to know, but its units would be kilogram meter squared. And it describes how quickly the mass increases as you move to the right. Now, we have a mass density. In the past, we would end up doing like, the, we would take the total mass and divide by the total length to get the mass density, but we can't do that now because we don't know what the total mass is. So we do know the total length. We know that this side is L and this side is zero, and that's the, the kind of the number line I'm setting up here. I'm going to draw a single box to represent a piece of the mass, and I'm going to call that dm. I need a way to point to this single piece, and I'm going to use x because that's already been defined here as part of the mass density. I have to describe the shape, I'm sorry, I have to describe dm in terms of the shape. So I'm gonna say that dm is a little bit more in the x direction. I will say that it is dx wide. I will then say that dm divided by dx has gotta be equal to the mass density. That is the mass per unit length, and that's gotta be lambda. So dm has to equal lambda dx, but I have an expression for lambda. It's c times x. So dm is cx dx. All the same steps we did before. The only difference is that instead of lambda, we would have put in m over l, but that was if it had a uniform mass density. We don't, so we have to put in the mass density. Only difference from our set of steps. Now, we also have not had to find the mass before. So this part is new. Let's do that first, find the mass. And that is just this part. Add up the whole mass. So the mass will be the sum of every piece of the object. So I'm going to start by replacing dm with something that's about the size of the object. Uh, Cx dx. I am replacing dm with our substitution Cx dx. And I need to add up each piece of the object, now each length, so I'm going to start at 0 and end at L. So, um, <coughs> this part is the math part, the stuff that the only advantage the calculus kids have over you. 
is a, their capacity to do this integration without having to think about it too much. But C is a constant. That's in the definition, so I can take it out in front. And that leaves me with x dx from 0 to L. Uh, since there's no, um, so no exponent there, that's x to the 1 power. So add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and my antiderivative will be 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to L, <coughs> which tells me that my mass will be 1 half C L squared. Any question about where that came from? All right. So to do center of mass, I have to take and do RDM. This is the weighted average. So I'm going to do that over here because it's really not much more work. I'm going to say that the center of mass, x center of mass, equals the top portion, which is the integral of r, well, no, not r, x dm, divided by the total mass, which is cl squared over 2. I'm going to do the top part of this fraction separately and then go back and sub it in. Is that okay with you guys? So the integral of x times cx dx is from 0 to l will give us the top part of this fraction. So, um, let's see out front, the integral, 0 to L, x squared dx. It's a polynomial again. So, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and get CL cubed over 3. And I have to divide that by CL squared over 2. This will give me the center of mass of the object. Um, looks like a CL cancels top and bottom, right? And I end up getting two-thirds of L. Well, that makes super reasonable sense, all right? It's somewhere between zero and L, and it's towards the heavy side. Ah, that's, that's nice and easy. Does it, does it bother you a little bit? that C didn't show up here? Are, are you bothered in any way by that? I'm bothered a little bit. Like I would have expected something that gets denser faster to, to show up here and where the center of mass is. Wouldn't you? And the reason it doesn't is because that same value for C was used to compute the mass. And so since the mass is based on C, and the center of mass is based on C, that's why C canceled out. It just seems weird that I would have expected it in my answer and it's not there. But my answer makes plausible sense and is in the appropriate units, right? L is a length, so this is two thirds of a length. All right, last is the moment of inertia. And this is about the end. So we're going from zero to L. Um, I'm going to replace r squared with x because x is the perpendicular distance. And it's x squared dm. I'm going to, of course, replace dm with cx dx. I'm going to pull the c out front. I'll be left from 0 to L of x cubed dx. I'm going to use the polynomial rule, which allows me to find the antiderivative to be 1 fourth x to the fourth evaluated from 0 to L. So my moment of inertia will be C L to the fourth over 4. Not terrible? Um, all right. So that's how you get those values. I'm not, I don't remember which one each one of you asked about. The rest of the problem is, is not terrible. It's just something we've already done before, um, having the bar swing downwards. Would you like me to continue to work the problem and do the swinging part too? All right, so now that we know calculate the moment of inertia is you'll change where you start and where you end. And because the value for r is uh, squared in the function, 
it generally doesn't make any difference. So if we wanted to find it from the center of mass, we would go and change these limits to go minus one third L to two thirds L and redo it because that's from the center of mass. And because the, even though this is negative, because it's to the fourth power, the negative sign would disappear anyways. And this is how the parallel axis theorem is proven, is by doing it this way with a generic shape. But it was an insightful question, and I will check on it. I believe this is still okay, but especially because it's a theorem. And so uh, generally theorems are true in all case things. Sorry, I'm doing this because Anthony went. So we can blame Anthony for that. Unless, of course, you need to see how it's done, then okay. So our pivot point is here. Um, it has gravitational potential energy here, and will have kinetic energy when it swings down to here. I need a way of measuring that gravitational potential energy. It's going to be based on the motion of the center of mass. And the center of mass is located two-thirds of the way towards the end, which means two-thirds of the way here. This two-thirds L has got to be the change in height of the center of mass. Does that make sense to all of you? Well, does that make sense to some of you? Good. I'm talking to you guys then. Uh, that means that MGH is going to equal, well, we have an expression for M that we have to use, CL squared over 2 times G times H, which is 2 thirds L. This will be the amount of gravitational potential energy. So um, cancel the 2s, cancel one of the Ls. I'm going to have CGL over 3 appears to be the gravitational potential energy. I think I've done my arithmetic correctly there. What's that? I think it's L cubed. Oh, it's L cubed. You're right. I guess I did not do my arithmetic correctly there. Thank you for correcting me. Yes. Do you want to put it in the calendar? That's what my wife does. So that every time it comes up in the next year, she can say, this is when Mr. Shelton made, well, she didn't say Mr. Shelton. She says something like, Daddy was wrong on this day and I was right. It's in the calendar like eight times in my calendar. It comes back every year. Yeah. It's okay. I, I don't have, you know, I am a humble person and uh, I am not bothered by it. The problem is that nobody can remember what, what it was that I was wrong about at that point. So it's like, I, I agree. I'm sure I was wrong. It's OK. Um, now we have to figure out how, much, uh, how fast it's going at the bottom. At the bottom, all the energy is in the form of kinetic energy, 1 half i omega squared. We have to use the expression that we have for i. So uh, let's see, Cl to the fourth over 4. So this is going to be 1 half Cl to the fourth over 4 omega squared equals C G L cubed over three. Um, you guys can solve that for omega. So I think I'm done with that part. Yeah. Where'd you get the C L fourth to the fourth or over four? It's the moment of inertia of the bar about its end. Okay. Mr. Shelton? Mm-hmm. Why didn't you also use um, translational kinetic energy? Because the the object is fixed in place. So we say that it's just rotating. We don't need to worry about its translational kinetic energy. If it didn't have this fixation in place, then we would have to worry about its translational kinetic <coughs> energy. But that would be because, you know, gravity is also doing work moving the object downward through space. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know it seems a little weird, like the whole thing is moving, but we just say it's rotating about a point. Um, it then says to move the, the point to the other end and swing it again. And I got asked a question third period that made me pause and think that maybe what I'm about to show you is incorrect. So I'm going to show you what I think we're supposed to do, but I have to prove whether that's right or not. I was going to look it up at lunch to make sure, but um, I did not have a chance. Uh, we have to move the, the um, axis of rotation to the other end. And 
I had said that the way to do that would be to uh, use the parallel axis theorem. And somebody in class uh, expertly asked, can we use the parallel axis theorem on something that is a non-uniform object? And my knee-jerk reaction was to say, well, yeah, sure, I don't, there should be no reason why we can't. But it was an insightful question, so I didn't want to just throw it away. And so, and it's been a long time since I've sat down and proven the parallel axis formula. I usually don't do it in class. So um, I don't know. I think this is right, and I'm pretty sure the parallel axis theorem works for any parallel axis through, uh, as long as you know what the, the moment of inertia is through the center of mass. Now, we didn't prove the moment of inertia through the center of mass, but we did prove the moment of inertia about the end. And the integration doesn't change very much if you want to move the moment of inertia. It just requires that you change your limits. So, like, we did our limits from zero to L when we did the moment of inertia. Well, all that happens if you're going to change the limits, but, but I'm going to check just to make sure. But I'm still going to show you what I think we're supposed to do. Um, which is bad, I wrote this question, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what we're supposed to do. This is what I intended you to do. We know the parallel axis theorem. This could figure out for us what the moment of inertia is through the center of mass. We have it about the end as CL to the fourth over four. We don't know what it is about the center of mass, but we would have shifted it two-thirds of L from the center of mass to the end to get the, parallel, the moment of inertia about the end. Well, you can just use the parallel axis theorem backwards to get the moment of inertia about the center. And that's what this would do for you. But once you have that, If we shifted that value a third of the way in the other direction, that should give us the moment of inertia about the other end. That's what I think you're supposed to do. Um, so use this one. <coughs> use this one to find a moment of inertia about the center of mass. Plug it in here, and I'll give you the moment of inertia about this end, not the other end. And if you do this all at one time, you just realize you're shifting it by L. That's what it works out to do. But um, again, I think this is how we're going to do it. After that, the problem is exactly the same, except that the center of mass is here. So your MGH is based on one-third L, not two-thirds L. Does that make sense? I'm not going to redo the problem because I want to verify that this is the right way to shift the moment of inertia. And I want to, I'm just going to prove the moment of inertia formula again to make sure it's right. But that's how I would do it. A child of mass 4 to 5 kilograms runs at 3 meters per second tangentially towards the edge of a merry-go-round of mass 200 kilograms and radius 2 meters. Boy, I love that size for a merry-go-round, apparently. Uh, it's not moving. The student jumps onto the edge of the merry-go-round and sticks the landing. How fast is the merry-go-round now spinning? And how much energy was lost in the collision? And why is angular momentum conserved but linear momentum is not? And how does the energy of the system change if the child walks to a point... 50 centimeters from the center of the merry-go-round. Right, there's a lot to do here. Who asked about this question? All right, all of it? All right. Don't be sorry. I, I am indifferent. This is fine. So, merry-go-round and kid. So, There's a kid running tangentially towards the merry-go-round. He's going to run and jump on the merry-go-round. So this is the before case. And the after case will be the kid on the merry-go-round. And the merry-go-round is spinning. Everybody got it? Um, the kid has kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. Since they're asking about kinetic energy, you might as well lay out all the things that the kid has. And that's one of them. 
the system over here will also have kinetic energy, one half I omega squared after the kid jumps onto it, because they do ask how much kinetic energy is lost. So we should prepare for that eventuality. Um, but this is a collision question, right? The kid jumps on the merry-go-round, and although linear momentum is not conserved, and the reason is because there's an external force in the ground on the merry-go-round that acts at the center of the merry-go-round. That keeps the merry-go-round from moving upwards after this collision. But that force acts at the center, so it doesn't provide a torque. Um, because of that, the torques are conserved because the torques end up being an internal force. There is a force on the kid from the merry-go-round, and there's an equal and opposite force on the merry-go-round from the kid. Those two things provide equal and opposite torques on the kid and the merry-go-round. So that's why angular momentum is conserved, but linear momentum is not. The kid's linear momentum, lowercase l, is going to end up being equal to the angular, angular momentum, uppercase l, of the merry-go-round and kid after he jumps on it. Angular momentum for a point mass is R cross P. And if you recall, R is measured from the pivot point to where the kid is, or the object is, and is relative to that angle and the direction of the momentum. But we never calculate it this way. We wait until the kid is jumping on the merry-go-round, and we use the distance of closest approach, which in this case, will end up being when the kid has advanced all the way to the merry-go-round and is just jumping on a merry-go-round here. <coughs> and that's going to change what we use for R to be the radius of the merry-go-round. So we don't calculate it out there. We didn't know how far away the kid was or anything like that. And this way, if we use this, we know that the, oops, we know the kid uh, is running at a tangent to the circle, so we know this angle is, is a right angle. We know that the radius is 2 and all that kind of stuff, so this will just be r, the radius of the ride, and we're using r perpendicular, and mv, the mass and velocity of the kid. So... R M V will be the angular momentum of the kid just before he jumps on the merry-go-round. After the kid jumps on the merry-go-round, the angular momentum of the system is I times omega. In this case, I is the moment of inertia of a disk, one half m r squared, plus the moment of inertia of the point mass of the child, m r squared, times omega. So one half big M R squared plus little m R squared times omega. All right, that's it. That's how we find out how fast the system's going after the collision. Um, we just got to plug the numbers in. So can I leave you to do that? Or do you want me to put the numbers in so you can see numbers on the screen? Okay, I'll wait a few moments because we're going to need those numbers in just a minute if we want to complete the rest of the problem. So uh, R was 2, kid was 45 running at 3 meters per second. That equals 1 half times 200 times 2 squared plus 45 times 2 squared times omega. So there we go. Point 0.466. All right, 0 0.466. Radians per second. All right. All right, so now that we know the angular speed, uh, we can figure out how much energy was lost during the collision. The kid has energy 1 half times 45 times 3 squared. That's their energy. But the merry-go-round after the collision is 1 half times I. You guys just did I, so I'm not going to rewrite all of that because we're running short on time. Times omega 0.466 squared. This will be how much energy was lost during the collision. Just find out the energy before, the energy after, and subtract. So again, the momentum is the same. We just have a new moment of inertia. The kid walked to the center. 
get a new velocity. What is it? 0.656. Yay! 0.656. Yay! Radians per second. Yay! We're all excited. Don't care. All right. There's a variety of the questions that we see in the exam, but some of them are, are far different than what we've seen so far. So one version, and the version I did in class third period, um, is from an actual old released AP exam. Uh, I'm going to do a, a different kind of version that's from an old released AP exam now. It has a, a person standing on a, on like a, a, the way they describe it is that it's a sheet of ice that's the shape of a disc. And it's on a friction-free surface, so a lake or something. It's just floating on top. And they first have the person stand here and throw something off and they do basically treating this like a conservation of linear momentum question. Whatever they throw off this dire direction has momentum, so everything here goes this direction due to the, the fact that there was no momentum before the throw. That's not a big deal. That's a fairly straightforward question, and we've done that one before. Then they have the guy turn and throw something this direction off of the sheet. This is where the problem changes. And because there's no external force on the system, both linear momentum and angular momentum are conserved. So not only does the center of mass of the, the, um, the, the floating disk start to move backwards, but the system also begins to rotate. Now, this problem isn't any more difficult than the one we just did, except that linear momentum is also conserved. So if we say that the thing that was thrown is mass m, and that the person is mass m, and the disc is mass capital M, we can kind of get an idea. Maybe he just pushed his friend off of the ice sheet. Sounds like something that one of you would do to one of your friends. You're both standing out there on the lake, and you're standing on a platform and one's a little close to the edge and you just say, bye bye friend. Um, I could see one of you doing that. Uh, should it be a friction-free environment? They would go drifting that way and you would go drifting the other direction on your ice disc sheet thing. Got it? All right. So if we say they throw it out at velocity v, the linear momentum of the problem, right, the linear part, is that there was no momentum before you pushed your friend. After you pushed your friend, your friend has momentum mv. You and the thing you're standing on will have momentum as well. But as you can probably imagine, when you solve for this, you're going to find that your velocity is negative. You push them forward, you and the thing you're standing on move backwards. Pretty straightforward? Okay. It's the next part that's not so easy. Your friend will end up having angular momentum relative to the center of mass of your system. This part's tough. Um, hear me very carefully. When you push your friend, your friend's going to have angular momentum, r perpendicular times mv. I'm using lowercase r here because this is not necessarily the radius of the disk. It's got to be from the center of mass of a system. You see, if there's no fixed pivot point, a system will spin about its center of mass. And the center of mass is somewhere between the center of the disk and where you're standing on the edge of the disk. So this problem becomes radically more complicated the moment that becomes the issue. Because you not only have to figure out where the center of mass is, which is probably somewhere in the middle here, that becomes the distance that you use for r perpendicular. But now you also have to find the moment of inertia of the system about that point. 
For the disc, that's easy. You're going to use the parallel axis theorem to shift it. And for the kid, it's not hard either because you're going to use him as a point mass. So this kid that's still here, his moment of inertia will just be m r perpendicular squared. But for the disc, you're going to have to use the parallel axis theorem. That's hard. That's really hard. Now, when they asked this question on the exam a couple years ago, they didn't have um, you pushing a friend off. They had you uh, jumping off, which meant that this went back to having the center of mass at the edge. But a couple, I'm sorry, center of mass at the middle. <coughs> but a couple of years ago, there was a question that wasn't a disc, but was a a plank. And you were standing at the edge of the plank and you threw something off. That's a realistic problem. And all the things we just described, same kind of thing here. This system's going to recoil that way and spin. Right. Goodbye, class. <laughs>